Amen. Good evening. So pastor asked me a few days ago to give a message tonight, and he said, hey, why don't you make it kind of a, a farewell message? And I was like, oh, how do you preach a message like that? So um, Jeff thinks I should just rip everybody's face off, and then it'll be easier, <laughs> it'll be easier to leave in a week, just call everybody out by name, make everybody hate me. Um, it, it's not an altogether bad idea, because as the day gets closer, we realize it's going to be, it's going to be difficult to leave. So when I think about, you know, uh, uh, a farewell message or, you know, things that encapsulate our last three years at Verity Baptist Church, Ephesians 15, uh, 5, verses 15 and 16 comes to mind um, when I was thinking about this, where the Bible reads, see that you walk, see that then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. This idea of walking circumspectly, you know, circumspectly means well-considered, you know, to consider well the time that you have, and redeeming the time, that's kind of, uh, when I think of my time at Verity Baptist Church, that's kind of an idea that kind of bookends, um, you know, our coming here and then our leaving here, is, you know, this idea of redeeming your time. You know, we came here in uh, 2016, and our first experience here was the, the very first Red Hot Preaching Conference. You know, we were... We were not like you. We were visitors to Verity Baptist Church at that time. And one of the people that I talked to uh, the most during that weekend was this guy named Joel Usher. And I was talking to Joel about you know, his experience, because Joel had moved his family from Colorado to um, Verity Baptist Church. And I was just I was fascinated by his story. And I spent a lot of time talking to Joel about the things that, you know, the details of that move and the things that he gave up to come here. And I remember there was uh, a time uh, when we were standing out by the bounce houses and watching the kids play, and he just kind of said to me, because, I mean, I was kind of wrapped up in all the thi- a lot of the things that Joel had given up at that point, you know, the, the business and the, the career, and that's kind of where I was at in my mind and my heart when I was a visitor to Verity Baptist Church in 2016. So Joel was talking to me about all the details of his move, and he said something to me, Um, that that sticks to me to this day, he said, you know, he turned to me when we were standing out by those bounce houses, and he said, he said, here's the thing, brother, he said, we're going to be dead soon. And my first reaction to that was, dead soon? You know, you're 10 years younger than me, what are you talking about? I'm going to be dead way before you. And I was just really taken aback, and it was kind of like, that was a really weird thing to say. But then I just kept thinking about it over the next day, two days, and that dead soon turned into, we're going to be dead soon. <laughs> and then on the flight home, it was kind of like, we're going to be dead soon, I'm telling my wife. And so we started this path in our lives of redeeming the time in our life. So circumspect, well considered. You know, you have so much time on this earth, right? We all have so much time, we don't know how much time that we have. In Psalm, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, time and science and time travel and all this kind of stuff, and people think that, you know, time is variable and it's something that we can control. Well, it's not something that we can control. It's something that's happening to us. In Psalm 31, verse 15, the Bible says, My times are in thy hand. David talking to God, saying, My times are in your hand. Time is something that happens to me. My time is in God's hands. However much time that, that is left, you know, it's, it's in God's hands. It's not in my hands. So we should well consider how we use that time. So I want to give you just three thoughts tonight on how you can use your time, how you can redeem your time. We can redeem our time. You know, how I can, you know, redeem my time, things that I think about a lot. Um, the first thought I want to give you tonight is for, you know, maybe a lot of you older folks out there tonight, and I don't even know what an older person is by definition. It's all... Uh, it's, uh, it's depending on your perspective, I guess. It's relative. But don't think that you're out of time is the first thing that I want to say tonight. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. In, in Acts chapter 7, we have uh, Stephen's sermon. And Stephen, in his sermon, he gives just this wonderful timeline, this kind of summary of the life of Moses. And, uh, you know, Moses is someone who is probably one of the most mentioned people in the Bible. You know, several books of the Bible talk about just the life of Moses. 
And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is giving the sermon that he gives right before he is stoned, right before he is martyred. And starting in verse 22, I just want to take a look at a few things about Moses' life and kind of apply that to maybe some of the older people in the room tonight or those listening. And in verse 22, we read that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So Moses was raised in Pharaoh's home. He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. And, you know, that was the first, the next verse says, and he, when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now, we don't really know much about, you know, what Pharaoh or what uh, Moses did as an Egyptian, but we know that he was mighty in words and deeds. He wasn't a nobody. You know, he was somebody that was some sort of leader, and you can kind of see it throughout Moses' character throughout his whole life. He was some kind of leader in Pharaoh's organization of some sort. It's interesting that we don't hear about it. I'll, I'll give you my theory on that um, in a few minutes. Verse 24 says, or verse 23, I'm sorry, verse 23 says that when he was a full 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. See, he knew he was a Hebrew, and he always considered himself a Hebrew. In verse 24 and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him. Another aspect of Moses' life that just characterizes Moses throughout the entire Bible. You know, he was an advocate. He was, you know, I believe if Moses took the personality test, he would be an advocate. That's what I believe. You know, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So in verse 25, we see he supposed that he thought, you know, he, I wonder if Moses knew that the purpose of his life, based on verse 25 here, was to deliver the people of Israel. And at this point, he's only 40, keep in mind. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and, one, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sir, as two Hebrews got in a fight now, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, Midian, where he begat two sons. And keep, pay attention to verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire in a bush. So we have 40 years Moses was in Pharaoh's house as an Egyptian. He was, he was mighty in word and deed. Then we have another 40 years, Moses fled to Midian. He got married to, uh, you know, Jethro, one of Jethro's daughters. You know, at Moses the defender, by the way, he was constantly defending people. That's how he met Jethro's daughters, is he defended them from the shepherds at the well. Once again, just defending people. And so that was another 40 years. And in Exodus 7:7, 7, 7, we see the Bible backs this up, saying, And Moses was four score years old, a score being 20 years and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spoke unto Pharaoh. So by the time Moses got to the point where he was doing what he was supposed to do, his purpose that God had for him in his life, he was 80 years old, and his brother was 83. Okay, that's, you know, you say, well, Moses lived a lot longer. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, we see the end of Moses' life, and the Bible reads, I'll just read it for you, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. So, Moses, from 80 to 120, that's the last third of his life, did fulfill the purpose that God had for him in his life. That's the last third of his life. We say, well, yeah, but he lived to be 120. You know, the average American lives to be about, you know, 79, 80 years old today. So if you're going to extrapolate that down to what's the last third of your life, that's if you just wouldn't even do anything and start serving the Lord when you're about 53. Okay. So Moses had, had already had two lifetimes, two careers pass before he even began his journey. So I wonder how many, you know, when I think about this, I wonder how many 50-year-olds or 55-year-olds or even 60-year-olds you talk to, or maybe there's some in this room who think, you know what, my time has passed. You know, it's the next generation. They can, they can raise up and serve the Lord and do great things. But Moses did the greatest things in his life and it's documented all the detail of Moses in the four books of the Bible that he is, he is documented in, it all happened in the last third of his life. So it's like you didn't even start until you were 53. So don't tell me that you have no time left. You know, Samson did his greatest works in the last 10 seconds of his life. 
You know, the Bible said that he killed more, you know, at his death than he did in all his life. So I wonder if the devil's plan is to convince people that, you know, their time has passed. To convince somebody, to convince some man or some woman or some family that has raised successful children and they, they have experience in life, to convince them that, you know what, we're done. You know what, isn't that American, really? Isn't this idea American that I have to go and I have to pile up money? I have to pile up money for 35, 40 years so I can just do nothing when I turn 60. My useful life ends when I'm 65. I used to think that myself. You know, when I was on the farm, I was like, man, I got to hit it hard for 20 years because after that, I'm done. But that's, that's not true at all. That's not biblical. I'm not against saving money. I'm not against planning for the future. But this is not biblical to realize that, you know, your life or there's nothing for you to do until, you know, you're, once you turn 60. It's not true at all. Turn to Ecclesiastes. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes quite a few times, so just stay there when you get there. But in Ecclesiastes 7, the Bible says this. Ecclesiastes 7, in verse number 8, the Bible says this. The Bible says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The Bible teaches thematically throughout the entire Bible that ending is much better than how you started. And I'm thankful for this, frankly, because I had a slow start. You know, I had a slow start. I didn't get saved until I was in my mid-30s. You know, I didn't even know there was a race. You know, I didn't know we were racing. You know, but look, you know, I'm 42 years old right now as I stand here today, and I feel like I'm just getting warmed up. And, you know, you should feel the same. So don't think that you're out of time is the first idea that I want to I lay before you tonight. The second thing um, I want to give to you tonight, turn to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11. This applies maybe more to the younger people, but it, it can apply to the older folks as well. In Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, the second point is this, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time in your life. When you're thinking about how to redeem your time, don't waste it. You know, it's a finite resource that you have. You have no idea how much of it is in that black box, but don't, so don't waste it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, in verse 9, the Bible says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, now, you're reading this, and you're like, what in the world? And then he says, but know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, it's sad that Solomon wasted pretty much his whole life. It's sad. But you know what? God brought the book of Ecclesiastes out of that situation so we can, so we can read it and learn from it and hopefully not repeat it ourselves, right? I mean, I believe that the devil's two-part plan for the Christian is to first get you in this room to fall into some grievous sin, you know, to, to just get you out of the fight in general. But if he can't do that, he would love to just have you just waste your whole life and be unfruitful. He can't take your salvation away from you. You know, that's against the rules of the game. He can't do that. You know, he can't break God's promise that he made towards you. But he can make you waste your life. He can get you to be unfruitful. Turn to Numbers 33. He can get you to be unfruitful, and he's pretty good at it. He's pretty good at it. In Numbers 33, we have Moses once again. He's talking to the children of Israel, and he's giving them a warning that God told them, uh, that God told him to give to the children of Israel right before they went into the promised land and took possession of the land. In Numbers 33, starting in verse 52, we hear Moses say, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land, and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance. And to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. But... If you will not drive out the inheritance, inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes, 
and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Now look, this right here is the doctrine of separation in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, there's this idea I've heard that, you know, the doctrine of separation is a New Testament thing. No. The doctrine of separation has always been here. It's right here. It says that if they don't separate completely from the people of the land, separate completely, they will be thorns in their sides and they will vex them all the days of their lives. You know, if you read Ecclesiastes, vexation, vexation constantly in that book. He's talking about separation. Think about all the men in the Old Testament that destroyed their lives and the lives of their families because they did not separate. Samson, Lot, bad one there. Jacob, Jacob as he stood before Pharaoh as an old man said, all the days of my life have been evil. He had a horrible life because he failed to separate. It's a big deal. Now, thorns. Turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Let's look at thorns in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 13. Thorns in your sides, the Bible said. In Matthew chapter 13, we see the parable of the sower. And Jesus is giving a, the parable of the sower. And in verse 3, he begins and he says, And he spake many things unto them in parables saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell in stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns and choked them, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold, and then down in verse 22, we see the, the, the interpretation Jesus gives of the thorns. And he says, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he become unfruitful. You know, I wonder how many of us can look, at, look back at things that we have chased after in our lives and attributed years, years to those things derailing us from doing what we were supposed to be doing. I know I can. You know, look, America, this country that we live in right now, it's just hedge of thorns after hedge of thorns after hedge of thorns. You know, we were talking about this a few days ago in my family, and, you know, this, this American dream, you know, life, liberty, you know, the pursuit of happiness has just turned into just the pursuit of just riches and just more stuff. And it's all thorns. It's all thorns that's just going to wrap us up and make us unfruitful. You know, the cars, the houses, the careers, all these things, the land, all of it is thorns. It's going to choke you, and it's going to make you unfruitful. And the funny thing is, is that when you're being choked by this, you might not see it yourself, but everybody else can see it. Everybody else can see that you're obsessed with the thorns that are wrapped around your neck that are making you unfruitful. In Ecclesiastes again, Chapter 2 and verse 8, or 18, I'm sorry. The Bible says, Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. There you go. Solomon's at the end of his life, and he says, I hated everything that I did. Because all he did was pile up a bunch of stuff that he's just going to give to the next generation, and we know how that worked out. But here's the thing. You know, there was even a saying back in North Dakota when I was growing up that, it, that the saying went like this, you know, old North Dakota proverb, right? It takes one generation to make it and one generation to lose it. And we've all seen it several times. It just happens again and again. You have some guy who built this big empire from nothing, and he leaves it to his son, and he just loses it all in 15 years. And, you know, maybe that's the best thing that could happen. Maybe it's best that that kid just loses it all in 15 years, especially if he's saved and he doesn't have those thorns wrapped around his neck for the rest of his life. Maybe it's best that he just loses it all. Ecclesiastes 1. You know, the Bible says, you know, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied by silver. Isn't that funny how God does that? He tells you that, you know, if you love silver, I'm going to make it so you can never be satisfied by silver. Isn't that awesome that God did that? You know, some people get, that joke gets played on them till the day they die. In Ecclesiastes 1, look down at verse 4. 
The Bible reads, Once one generation passeth, passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. And then we see a, a, a list of a bunch of cycles here. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasten to its, his place where he arose. A cycle. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Another cycle. The next verse. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Another cycle. So here's a depressing thought for you. If you die right now, or today, or tonight, the sun's coming up tomorrow. You know, fall's coming in a, in a couple months. The seasons are going to keep going. Everything's going to continue on. All that will be left of you on this earth when you die is what you have done here. That's it. Now, just imagine if what that boils down to is a bank account, a nice house, and a few cars. That's depressing. That's depressing. Now, think about Pastor Jimenez. God forbid if he would die. Souls are still getting saved on Saturday, right? We're still going soul winning two, three times a week in this church. Souls are just going to keep continuing to get saved, continuing. This work will continue. That's the kind of legacy that Solomon is telling us to have instead of this, instead of all these thorns and piling up all these hedges of thorns. You don't know if you have five minutes or 50 years left. I've been talking about old people and young people. It doesn't matter at all. Because you could be 16 and die tomorrow. You could be 60 and live another 40 years. You have no idea. That's the funny thing. So redeem your time. It has nothing to do with how old you are. Okay? Look, young people, let me just say one last thing on this last point. If you do get wrapped up in thorns, because young people are going to get wrapped up in these thorns in their life. Unfortunately, it's, they're, they're prone to it. But if you get wrapped up in these thorns in your life, and God willing, you do snap out of it, or someone snaps you out of it, you will look back, and you will see wasted years. Not days, not weeks. Wasted years. You'll wake up, and you'll be 35. You'll wake up, and you'll be 50. You'll be like, whoa, how did that happen to me? Well, I'm telling you now, pay attention. Okay, look, here's one last thing. I'm mentioning names tonight. The day before, look, I didn't come to Verity Baptist Church to go into the ministry. It, it wasn't on my radar screen when I moved here. I did not come here to go into the ministry. I came here to get my family in a good church. I came here personally to learn how to win souls to Christ. You know, I wanted to do something, you know. I, I hadn't been doing anything. I wanted to, to do something. And the ministry wasn't on my radar screen, but about a year or maybe a year and a half ago, I started to really get burdened about, you know, that I should be doing more. And, you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Jeff the day, the day I went and I told Pastor that I, you know, that I changed my mind on this. I was out soul winning with Jeff. And I was telling Jeff, I was like, you know, I told him just this very thing. I said, I, I didn't plan to go into the ministry when I, I came here. You know, Jeff was talking about his plans. You know, Jeff has great plans for his life. And I was telling him about, you know, things, you know, that I've been praying about and, and thinking about and praying more about. And, and I said, you know, I didn't come here to go into the ministry. I just came here, and I was willing to give everything up. I told him, I said, I was willing to just go work at Home Depot when I came here. I didn't know if I was going to have a job. I didn't know. I was just going to take some job. Yet God just blessed me. God, God gave me a, a, a decent job where I could continue you know, down the, the career path, you know, thorns that I was on. And, and Jeff, Jeff said to me, when we were soul winning, he said, he said, look, he's like, would the, would the decision to go into the ministry be easier or harder if you would right now be working at Home Depot? And I'm like, whoa, you know. So, what, basically what Jeff was saying is, are you taking the blessings of God and throwing them in his face? Right? Look what Solomon did. Solomon was blessed greatly by God when he was young, and he just, he just turned from God. He turned away, and he didn't do anything with it. 
You know, don't take the blessings that God has given you and use them against him. People do it all the time. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Look, if you're, if you're an American today, you're rich. You know, you're rich. You've been greatly blessed by God. Don't use those blessings against God. Third point tonight. And this one is for uh, the, the guy who grew up Baptist. And then I also wanted to apply to the guy who didn't grow up Baptist, like myself. And the third point I want to give you tonight is don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on the past. Turn to Hebrews 12. For the Baptist, how could the Baptist, the person who got saved when he was eight years old, how could he dwell on the past? What in the world are you talking about? Well, I think some people could possibly get this idea that, you know what? I've done enough. It's, like I said earlier, it's the next generation's turn. I've done enough. Um, I've served God my whole life. Um, are you there in Hebrews 12? Let me leave this thought for that person. In Hebrews 12, the context of Hebrews 12 and verse 1 is the few verses before the Bible is talking about all of the prophets and all of the horrible things. Just peek back at it right now that they suffered. They were sawn asunder. They were tormented. They were afflicted. They were thrown in prison. You know, they were, they were killed. And then in, in verse 1 of Hebrews 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Those are the witnesses that are watching us. You've done nothing compared to what these people have done. I, I love to read like historical accounts of things. The Bible talks about the first apostle that was martyred was James, the son of Zebedee. He was killed. Uh, Herod killed him with the sword. That's all the Bible says about it. But there's, there's a couple historical accounts, and I understand that these aren't the Bible, but they certainly line up with the Bible, that talk about some more detail of what actually happened when James was executed. Remember James, the son of Zebedee, the sons of thunder? When James was, was executed, Fox's Book of Martyrs and also the Martyr's Mirror account James's execution where he's walking to be executed and he gets the executioner saved. And the executioner professes Christ and they're both executed together. A soul winner for Jesus. Can you imagine? All the way to the bitter end, he's soul winning, period. This is the, the cloud of witnesses that is watching us as we run this race. These are the guys. Every single one of the apostles was martyred except for John, according to, you know, secular history. They were all killed in horrible, horrible ways. These are the people that are watching us. It's like being in a track, at a track meet and all the best athletes in the world are watching you from the bleachers. You know, we, we've, do, we do, we've done nothing. We live in America. Any persecution is ridiculously silly compared to this, right? <clears throat> so that's for the Baptist who thinks I've done enough. You haven't done enough. You haven't even begun to get started. The latecomer, to the person who got saved later in life, God doesn't want to use me. You know, maybe you think that you're just focused back on the past too much. In Psalm 103, 12, here's how much you should focus on the past. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. God doesn't even remember your sin. Get on the trail and get moving. Imagine, I mean, just imagine. Imagine being lost in the woods, in the forest for hours or days or whatever, and somebody comes up to you, and they give you a map, and they say, hey, hey, the, the, the trail is 200 yards this way. There you go. You're not lost anymore. Imagine how stupid it would be if you just sat right down there and just lamented on how you've been lost. Oh, and by the way, they tell you where the trail is, and then they tell you, it's a race. Get moving. Imagine how dumb it would be if you sat down and lamented on how you've been lost for five days. Amen. Stupid. Yet isn't that what we do? That's what I did. That's what I did Like when I got saved. You know, I, I was in my mid-30s, and I'm just like, I don't know, it was at least a year. I'm like, man, I can't believe I was wrong for that long. 
That's terrible. I was wrong, really wrong. I wasn't even like close. But how dumb is that, that we do that? It's just a waste of time. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of our life. Get on that trail. You know, what you should do is, if you've been lost for 35 years, you get on the trail and you're like, oh, it's a race. Ah! And you just get moving, right? All right. So in conclusion, you know, you sit here and you're like, all right, I'm here on Wednesday night at Verity Baptist Church. I go to church three times a week. You know, what's your problem, buddy? You're being kind of harsh. You know, what's the point? But here's the thing. Let me just kind of break down, like, who's in the room here, in case you guys don't know. You know, most saved people, when you think about saved people out there, first of all, most people, the vast majority of people aren't, aren't even saved in the world, right? The vast majority of people. You know, 1%, 2%, maybe. Most saved people don't even, you know, don't even go to church or do a good church, right? Like you do, right? It, but, but you... You not only go to church, but most of you are sold out. You know, you're, you're going three times a week. You're soul winning. You know, that puts you in even a smaller group of people, right? The, mass, the vast majority of people don't do that. And then you have this tinier subset of people who have actually moved here. You know that if you're here, you know, just for you new people, we have some new families. You know that if you're here in this group of people, and you've moved to Verity Baptist Church, you're really nothing special because so many people have done it. It's really not a big deal. You know, there's like, you're just like Brother Joel or Brother Devin or Brother Luke or Brother Jeff or whatever, Brother Oliver. I mean, I can look around and just pick them out right now. Brother Chad, everybody. It, you're not that special in this group of people, but you know what? Most people, turn to Matthew chapter 9. Most people are never going to do that. They are never going to do what you did. And in Matthew chapter 9, we see Jesus' attitude here towards a certain type of people. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, the Bible says, but when he saw the multitudes, Jesus, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Look, most people are sheep. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's always going to be. God knew it. Jesus knew it. That's why sheep need shepherds, or they're scattered everywhere. Trust me, I was a literal shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. That's why Jesus said, you know, and when I'm talking about redeeming your time, I'm not just talking about going into the ministry. Redeem your time, only you know what God has for you, what service that you should be doing. You should be praying about that. God will show you what you should be doing. And if you pray about those things, you'll know if you're wrapped up in things of this world, if you're wrapped up with thorns and you're not doing what God has for you. It's not just about the ministry, but when it comes to these sheep, people have to go. That's why Jesus said, go ye therefore. That's why we go out soul winning. That's why we don't just sit in the church and eat donuts and just have people come in the door and be like, what must I do to be saved? Because they're not going to come. They're not going to come and ask us. They're not, the vast majority of people, no matter how you live your life, are not going to ask you how to get to heaven. Period. You have to go to them. People need, that's why we need more churches like this one. If people, if everybody would just move here, there, we'd only need this one. That's it. They'd all just come here. We'd have to get a bigger building. But they would all just come here. That's not how it's going to work. We need more churches because people aren't going to move here. And, and we're not supposed to just have this bad attitude towards them. We're supposed to have compassion on them and go Amen. to them. And it, it should be us that, that go. Amen. Okay? Now, the whole point uh, of the whole sermon tonight is this. You know, whether it's not just about the ministry. Whether God has given you five talents, two talents, or just one talent. You know, if you're, if you're not using these talents, 
because of you know, the cares of this world, because you're wrapped up in thorns, if you're not using these talents because you think that it, it's, it's not your turn anymore, if your heart is beating, if you have breath in your body, it's your turn. It's your turn. Or if you're just dwelling on silly things in the past, if you're sitting in the woods lamenting over being lost, it, it's, it's not right. You need, to, you need to cast these things, these thoughts off. Follow what the Bible says. And, and get moving, okay? Now, normally, I would, I would close with prayer right here, but at first, I just want to say thank you um, to everybody here. I want to thank um, Pastor Jimenez, first of all. He's not here, but, um, you know, Pastor Jimenez is, is a very easy person for me to follow because he's a man who leads with character and integrity, and, and it's really easy, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, because it doesn't, you know, the, the man is 10 years younger than me. Matters not. The man is, he, he's got character, integrity, he leads by example, and it's, and it's just a joy to serve underneath somebody like that. And I look forward to continuing to serve under that leadership as we go to Fresno. Well, I mean, what a blessing. I mean, I have no experience in this. I, I don't think that I have some kind of experience. I have experience in some things, not this. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm extremely thankful. I thank God that I have that man to, to watch over me as I go on this, this next chapter in my life. I want to thank all of you for showing me how to serve. You know, one thing that I've learned over the last uh, several months is this whole thing that happens here three times a week, it doesn't just happen. <laughs> you know, it doesn't just... I mean, the bulletins, the programs, the, the church is always nice. I mean, that is a combination of dozens of people coming together and serving the Lord and serving this church. And I just want to thank you for showing me how to do that over these last three years. I want to thank you for showing me how to evangelize. You know, I mean, uh, you know, thank you for showing me how to be a soul winner. I mean, what a great... Uh, blessing that this church has been on me and on my family in this, you know, we've evangelized the world in this church. Think of it. Think of it. There's 150 people here or whatever there is. We, the power in this building for the gospel is unparalleled. This church has so much power, for, you know, it, in going out and preaching the gospel to the world. It is, it's awe-inspiring. So thank you for showing that to me and, you know, giving me the motivation to continue that. Thank you. And, and you know, just thank you. I, I gave you a couple conversations that, that I've had with some men in the church, you know, things that just rattled around in my brain and I couldn't get them, get them you know, out of my head. Those are just a couple things. You know, there's been many conversations I've had with the men in this church, and I'm sure you ladies could say the same with the ladies. I don't want this to be a thing about, you know, just the men. But I want to say thank you for sharpening me. I mean, you think about one of the joys of me being here over the last three years is, you know, thank you for sharpening my family, my kids. We're different people now. We are different people. You know, I look at one of the joys of, of me being here, when I look at back at the last three years, is watching these teenagers grow up in this church. I've seen, I've seen these boys I only have experience with the boys, but the girls are, I'm sure, the same. That I've seen these boys go from boys to just these, these strong young men. It's crazy. I hired a couple of them to help me move, and I was like, I had the busiest week of my life. I can't even remember what day is it. I don't even know. But, I mean, I'm homeless and unemployed, and I've never been so busy. <laughs> but I hired a couple of these kids to help me move, and I was just, I was, I was kind of overwhelmed at one point in the moving, and I just said, I said, I said, I, we're not going to get it all done today. We're going to have to drive it out tomorrow. We'll load the truck tonight. There's just too much stuff. And Moses says, no, we can do it. And I'm just like, I'm like, we can do it. You know, you're right, 16-year-old. But it's awesome. I, I had these kids in, in the class. And I've just seen them just turn into just wonderful young people. I'm so, I, I don't want to say I'm proud of them, but I am proud of them. Okay, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of, you know, that just shows 
Folks, that shows, to wrap everything up, it shows the importance of a church like this. It shows the importance of a group of families that will separate themselves from, a world, from the world and they will come into a church like this. And it's possible. It's possible to do these things and it's possible to raise kids like this in, in, a, in a wicked world like we're living in today. It's possible. We're seeing it happen. And more people need it. So that's why we're going. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to work as hard as I can. I promise you that. And I thank you for all the support that you've given me and my family um, in this adventure. I will work as hard as I possibly can. I promise you that. And God will build the church. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. I thank you um, for Pastor Jimenez. And I I thank you, Lord, for building this church. And I thank you for the, the great blessing that everybody in this room and, and the pastor has been on my life and, and on, on my family's life. And Lord, I, I just ask you to bless all these people. I ask you to bless everything that they do in their life. And I ask you to remember, to keep them remembering that when you bless them, not to, to wrap those blessings around their neck and turn them into thorns, Lord. That everybody in this room understands that this world needs them. That they're such an elite group of people, Lord, that... There, there's so much potential here, Lord. Just, just bless these people, keep them humble, and, and help them redeem their time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.